All right, let's go on with the, get going with this lecture. This is more two-way analysis of variance, factorial analysis of variance. We're just going to run through another example. Um, but first, we're going to talk a little bit um, about what we're going to be looking at here. We're going to be looking at the effects of educational methods. That's the first independent variable. And st instructor education, the second independent variable, on students' grades in a math course. I'm being a little loose with independent variable. I should so probably say predictor and response. Oh well, the slides are already made. So factor A is the educational method used. You'll note that that is a categorical variable. Level 1 is traditional lec lecture, level 2 multimedia presentations, and level 3 group learning, level 4 self-directed learning. And factor B is the instructor degree. Level 1 is bachelor's, and level 2 is master's. So try and imagine what this looks like. I'm going to go to the next slide, and I think we'll see some explanation of what it looks like at that point. The dependent variable is going to be the student's grades in the course, and that's our numerical dependent response outcome variable. That's what everybody's dancing around. So one way to look at a design for a two-way ANOVA is to draw a, a two-way table, but in, but we put something in those, um, we, we often put something in the cells that's a little bit different from a chi-square. Now here it is kind of like a chi-square because we're just putting the sample sizes in each. And this is how we can look and see if there's more or less balanced sample sizes. And some people talk about ANOVAs as being balanced when they have exactly the same number of observations in each cell. That can be damnably hard to do because what if one person drops out of the study? But there are some advantages to that. You can do some extra special things with your analysis and you can really trust some aspects of your analysis if you have a balanced ANOVA. But it's actually not that common because it's really hard to make sure that that happens to, to force that to go in a balanced way. <coughs> now, I talked about two levels to this variable and four levels to this variable. What that means for an all-between subjects ANOVA, and of course you can have repeated measures like paired samples type ANOVA, and you can have either or both of these factors be repeated measures, factors. We're not going to deal with that right now. We're going to deal with all between subjects ANOVA. And what that means is you've got to have eight groups of people. You've got to have eight classes. And so you, you need students learning from a bachelor's level instructor using lecture, masters using lecture, bachelors using multimedia, masters using multimedia, bachelors using group learning, etc. You've got to have all those combinations or else you can't test this. So setting this up gets a little funky, and often you don't see cells of 30 or 50 per, per cell, your sample sizes. You see smaller sample sizes, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20. Bigger is always better, but you've got all these cells, it gets complicated. So if you're thinking, I'm going to do this grandiose study, well, yeah, you need to figure out where you're going to get those participants from and how much of your life you're going to lose in running that study. So we can also just write the name of the dependent variable in there. I've seen that from time to time, and sometimes I do that just to sort of conceptually say this is what my study is. Um, but the most common thing to do is write the means and sometimes the standard deviations in each cell. We don't really need the standard deviations much because we'll see that they're pretty similar. I mean, we've got something that's as low as 9.9 .9 here and as high as, so like 10, 16. That's not bad. This is okay. There's there's not going to be a violation of the uh, equal variances condition as far as we can tell. Those standard deviations are not that different from each other. Because standard deviations, it doesn't matter as much when they're different. When they're too different, it's a big deal. But it takes more to make them too different. So I used a big M for sample size or for sample mean. So you can look at these means and you can start to get a sense of the pattern of results going on here. But we also need the marginal means. To really start to understand what's going on, we need the marginal means. So these are the means of the different lecture types. So if you combine the bachelor's and the master's students' grades together, then you get an effect of lecture type on, or sorry, of educational method on the students' grades. And you see that lecture has you know, 77, the grades are 77, and then multimedia was lower group was lower, and then self-directed learning was the lowest. Um, I didn't make these data up. Somebody else made them up. <laughs> I believe they're fake, but not made up by me. Or you could collapse and look at the effect of the instructor's degree collapsing across everything else. There's not as big an effect there. 
And in fact, the bachelor's degree instructors look like they're doing better than the master's degree instructors. Their students, on average, did better than the master's students did. So this is another way to diagram your study before you get going, just to kind of look at things. And this isn't just diagramming the study conceptually, it's also showing you some results, because you see some means there, right? So it's very common to use those means and make a plot. Uh, if I were more responsible, I would have used, I would have put in the, um, the confidence intervals there vertically. I was using Excel and feeling a little on the lazy side, so I just did this and the dots, which you can't see, the vertices of the bends, those should be dots, and that's where the means are. So you can see that these things are not parallel. But that's not surprising. Nothing is ever really parallel. So your question is always, given the sample size, are they enough parallel that we would conclude that they are non-parallel in the, in the population? So let's think through this. Is there a main effect of, well, maybe it's easiest here to think, is there a main effect of lecture type? So the average, or sorry, of instructional type, the average for the lecture instructional type will be halfway between these two points. And then the average for multimedia is a little lower. It's between these two points. And then group is a little higher. And then self-directed is way down here. So it looks like there is an effect uh, for that. And we can imagine the effect of the bachelor's level versus the master's. We have to kind of imagine all the four points that are on the purple line, what's their average? And the four points on the red line, what's their average? Now we know they're going to be pretty similar. Another way to look at this is to graph the data differently. We put the other variable on the x-axis and the one that used to be on the x-axis is now represented by different lines. So if you look at these points here for bachelors, the average is maybe up here somewhere. And if you look at these points for masters, the average is maybe a little lower. So we're getting a very slight difference there. It's a little easier to see this way. Which of those graphs made the most sense to you? This is an important thing to think of. I recommend when you're doing any kind of a two-way study, do the graphs both ways. Try the parallel, non-parallel lines trick mentally, or even by printing it out and drawing things on there. And stick with the one that makes the most sense to you. Now, in some fields and some variables, there's a standard way to do the graph. They'll say, no, this one is on the axis and these ones are the lines. But sometimes it's left up to you, and you just have to pick the one that is the easiest to understand. So let's look at the results here. Remember, there's going to be multiple between subjects results and only one f within subjects set of results. So, <laughs> sorry, um, I didn't realize we were quite at the end quite yet. So all three of these things are the between subjects results. Sum of squares for the educational method, sum of squares for instructor degree, and the educational method by the instructor degree. All three are statistically significant. You can see the degrees of freedom here, three here, one here, and actually it's just three times one, so three for the interaction. We say x and we say by, but it actually is a multiplication thing. Yeah, and then the error, the error terms here, just for comparison. All three of those things are significant. Let's go back and see if we can make sense of that. So, yeah, the average here and the average here, I guess the average for bachelors is a little higher than the average for masters. I guess that's enough for the main effect of the instructor education to be significant. And these means are quite different, at least they seem to be, and I guess that's enough given the sample size and given the, vari the variability within groups, that's enough to say that there are differences between the different groups, um, between the different le instructional method groups in how they perform. And then we can also say that the effect of, edu of instructor education is different for, different for different kinds of instructional tools or instructional methods. And that's the interaction we're talking about there. We could also say the effect of instructional methods is different for different instructor education levels. That's an equivalent way of saying that we have an effect. You should really practice saying those things, writing them out, trying to make them accurate. That's a good way to make sure that they get sunk into your head correctly. Not just seeing them and visualizing them and not just thinking, oh, the lines are parallel, the lines are non-parallel, but thinking through point by point, mean by mean, what does that mean? Which is higher? Which is lower? And then trying to combine those into statements that all together make sense. So going back here, 
I'm just going to leave that here because end of the slides and we'll have one more lecture here as far as this goes and then we're going to be pretty much done with the video lectures for two-way analysis of variance.